Good morning. Well, I uh, discovered something about myself recently. And um, it's funny because at my ripe age, I had two thoughts after this discovery. I thought, wow, I am 57 years old and I'm still learning things about myself. Isn't that great? Gosh, I'm still, just still having some self-awareness. And then followed immediately after that was this thought. Oh, for crying out loud, I am 57 years old. How come I haven't figured this stuff out yet? What the heck is the matter with me? I go from like patting myself on the back to just like shame and guilt, just like the flip of a switch. I'm hoping I'm not alone in that, but I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands. Anyway, the thing that I discovered about myself um, is likely not to shock anyone who knows me well. I really like to be in control. I know my family's like, uh, yeah, you think? Uh, not controlling. I don't need to control what everybody else is doing. I just like to be in control of my situation. Like, I, I, it's about powerlessness for me. I don't like feeling like I have no power to change or fix or control what's happening. And what led me to this important discovery about myself is that I realized I kind of have a pattern. When I feel a little bit out of control, I tend to get um, a little bit stressed out. I start to feel it like right in my chest. And then I do this really fun thing where I um, start getting a little bit nitpicky and, and um, defensive, and then I start to cry. So it's really fun. And um, I, I felt this coming on recently, and I was like, why is this happening? What is going on for me? And then I was like, oh, right. I have zero control right now. I'm, I'm 57, but I'm starting to get it. I don't like that feeling. So I'll give you an example. When I was uh, 21, so it's been going on for a while, um, I was driving home from college for Thanksgiving weekend. And I lived about an hour and a half away from, from uh, campus, you know, my, my family home. And I was just about there, just about to Fort Collins, and I was going up the exit ramp to Fort Collins when my car, my little 1976 Fiat, started to sputter and stall out as I'm going up the ramp. And I was like, no, 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 no. So I start like doing everything I can to coax my little car up the freeway and off the ramp. And um, you know, I know exactly two things about cars. One is where to put the gas in, and the other is how to start it. And so this completely freaked me out. I do know where to put the windshield wiper fluid now, so I've got that going for me. But this experience completely freaked me out. I started pounding the, wind the uh, steering wheel, and I started crying. And I just want to make one thing clear. Everything was fine. I made it to the gas station. I borrowed a uh, phone from them, because this was in the days before cell phones. Called my mom. She came and picked me up. Everything was fine, but I didn't know that yet. And in that moment, I felt powerless about having my car die on the freeway. I know it's kind of a silly example, and I could give you a lot more, trust me. But the point of that illustration is that the brain does not really differentiate between real and perceived threats. We go right to, this just got real. And then we sort of back down from there. And in my case, maybe in yours too, we, we have to, to find a little self-awareness sometimes for what's triggering us to go right to emergency crisis mode. Well, one thing that researchers know for sure is that when a person experiences too much too soon, or too much for too long, or not enough for too long, that is stress-inducing. So let me repeat that. When a person experiences too much too soon, or too much for too long, or not enough for too long, that is stress inducing. Hello, pandemic, <laughs> right? We are experiencing this collective trauma or at least collective stress 
worldwide right now because we are having this shared experience of too much, too soon, and too long. And there's going to be some traumatized people out there still for quite some time. We're not even to the healing stage of this yet. We're still in the figuring it out stage all these months later. Things are coming at us fast and furious, not as fast and furious as they were in the beginning, but the landscape is still changing rapidly, and we're going to be dealing with the COVID fallout for quite some time. Now, in today's reading in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is talking with his disciples, and he just made a statement that sounded a lot like, too much, too soon, and for too long. In chapter 21, he says, everything you see here is going to be gone. Not one thing will be the same. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Families will be in disarray. You will be hated and persecuted. There will be earthquakes and famines and great signs from heaven. He says people will be utterly confused by the rolling of the sea and the waves and that people will faint because of what is coming in to the world and that the heavens themselves will be shaken. Jesus goes on to say, pray that you will have the strength to endure it all and don't let yourselves be lured into complacency. He tells them to get ready because there will be signs and you don't want to be caught unaware, drunk, or either living decadently or weighed down with worries, which is, of course, ironic given the list of worrisome events he's just rattled off. But are your palms starting to sweat a little bit listening to that? You feel a little tightening in your chest? You want to pound on the steering wheel a little bit with me? Jesus was, of course, talking about a particular event to to a particular group of people at a particular point in time. Historically, he was in Jerusalem, which was suffering under the oppressive Roman rule. And when he speaks of what's coming, he uses the Greek word here for world, which actually refers to the political and economic realm, as opposed to like the whole world or the cosmos. So in other words, Jesus was likely talking about the collapse of the world the way they knew it in the Roman Empire specifically. And the beauty of the gospel is that We can never deny that when Jesus is speaking to a particular group in a particular time, that he is also somehow speaking to us in our time, in the particularity of our place and time. How can we not read into what he's saying here? How can we not make comparisons? And rightly so. I read these verses and I feel like I am right there with Jesus, not in Jerusalem, but in this world right now in the USA in November 2021, listening to him teach and talking to us about our human brokenness and grief, about our shattered systems and environmental crises and and, and, and about how I need to be alert my mind can't differentiate between real and perceived threats. And this feels real, what I'm hearing this morning. Jesus is not messing around here in chapter 21. He's not trying to make everything feel pretty or tender or pat us on the back and say, don't worry. And in a surprising twist for somebody like me, Jesus doesn't say to them, well, Whatever you do, when this all goes down, you better be in control of it. Don't let those wheels come off the bus. He does not say that. In fact, Jesus says one thing that is so powerful and huge that I think you might need to hear it this morning. I need to hear it this morning. This is what he says. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up, raise your heads, because your redemption is near. When Jesus slipped into this world, into the form of an infant, 
It meant God came into the world to walk among us. The one whom Isaiah referred to as Emmanuel, God with us. God entered into a violent, oppressive, unjust world then, just as God enters into the violent, oppressive, and unjust world now. In doing so, God wants to heal us. That is what God has always wanted, human flourishing in mind, body, and soul. God is present in our suffering, in the too much, too soon, and too longness of life. God doesn't orchestrate suffering, but God goes through the suffering with us, guiding us, teaching us, shining a light on our own beautiful abilities to make the world a better place, to make ourselves stronger, more loving, more reliant on God, shining a light on our own beautiful inabilities, reminding us that we cannot do anything on our own, but in Christ who strengthens us. God alone has the ability to heal, reconcile and restore the world. But God might see fit to use human beings to make it so. Scientists who invent vaccines, watchdogs in the world to make sure that we're paying attention to injustice and inequality, tireless advocates, loving friends and family members, people who meet us in our need, policy makers, judges, juries, neighbors, community members who are committed to doing the next right thing. Scripture tells us that in the end, God will wipe away every tear. But until then, God is at work in us, calling us to participate in the reconciliation of the universe. Indeed, that is our mission. In the face of the absurd suffering that we see around us, that is what God is calling us to. We are the hope, but not we alone. Stand up. Raise your heads. There's work to be done while we're still able to do it right now in this lifetime. We can do this because in the midst of the confusion and the suffering, there will be signs. Look around you. I bet you thanked God for a few of those signs just when you gathered around the turkey table on Thursday. Even in the midst of chaotic and out of control events in this world, in the most gut-wrenching pain, in the earth-rending moments, our redemption is so near. In the end, sin and brokenness doesn't have the last word. Human flourishing does. In the end, everything that's wrong will be put right. Every tear will be wiped away and every life will be restored to God's loving embrace. That is our promise for eternity and for today. So when your temptation is to want to control everything, there's a high likelihood that fear is at work. Fear of being powerless, fear of the unknown. So we try in vain to control the outcome, to make something known or familiar. We have a fear of not looking like we have it all together, or in my case, knowing I don't. We have a fear of being judged, a fear of being wrong, a fear that the world is falling apart and we don't know how to fix it. But as my wise chiropractor said to me recently when trying to pull my shoulders out of my earlobes and back where they belong because I was carrying the weight of the world, Control is an illusion. In the end, there's only one thing that we can really control, and that's our reaction to the grief of the world. And this is where hope comes in. When we've tried everything else, hope is what remains. When resentment, 
anger, arguing, denial, cheerfulness, optimism, pretending, prayer, groveling, when all those things fail, remember that circumstances looked pretty bleak 2,000 years ago. And a baby was born in a manger as a sign that God is always with you. Hope in that is what's left when all of our other efforts to control the world fail us. We talk about waiting in joyful anticipation during Advent because we need the reminder that we are powerless when God is not near. But God came into the world to be near and to walk among us so that we would have all the wisdom, guidance, patience, and love that we need right here within. Christ is nearer to us than we are to ourselves. How do we know? Look for the signs. They're all around us. And then stand up. Raise your heads because your redemption is near. Because God is here. Amen.